You're listening to Level Up Your Business, the podcast where we talk to hardworking business owners and leaders and help them solve real issues in real time. I'm your host, Sarah Frasca, restaurant owner, keynote speaker, and business coach. I've spent my career not only in corporate America, but also as an entrepreneur, carrying on my family's legacy through my restaurant. Now, a business coach and consultant, I'm helping other businesses to use creative problem solving and innovative thinking to drive lasting change. Stay tuned to hear some inspiring guidance that will help you to level up your business. And today, I am joined with my teammate, Laura Rather, and we are going to chat with a very special person to me, Matt Goodermuth. Um, Hello, Matt. Welcome. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having me today. I'm excited to be here. And nice to see you, Laura. Same, Matt. Thanks for being here. So funny enough, Matt and I, I'll I'll start maybe with my background with Matt. Um, We got to know each other in two places in our community, kind of here in Ponte Vedra Beach. And the first was that we were both a part of the Jacksonville University Davis College of Business Board, so kind of the board of advisors. And we got to sit on the board and help the students, help the faculty, help the school Um, So that was an honor and and really got to know Matt then. But it turned out he lives in my neighborhood, basically, and goes to my restaurant. So you're a Traska. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for the support. Zach is the best. Oh, I know. Everyone listening knows Zach is the best. (laughs) Um, So thank you again for supporting the restaurant. I mean, you and I get together every so often because I feel like we have this mind meld when we come together and we just like, like froth with ideas and, oh my gosh, we should do this and we should do that. And anyway, I always enjoy chatting with you. So thanks for being on the show. As you know, Laura and I come from General Mills and your background, which you'll share with folks in just a minute, is kind of a a tangent and it's kind of funny, but you know how they say like the six degrees. I mean, I bet we're like two degrees of separation, all three of us, yeah. because we know the same people. We grew up in the same world. So yes. why don't we start there, Matt? Tell us about your career and how you got to where you are today. Uh, I'm happy to. <laughs> um, so I grew up in the food and beverage business. And when I say grew up, um, I literally was born into it. My father uh, was with Nabisco for 42 years. Um, My dad was my hero, my best friend. Um, So outside of becoming a professional baseball player, um, there was nothing else I was going to do except follow in my dad's footsteps, which unfortunately, I couldn't become a professional baseball player. Um, So I went to work for PepsiCo. Um, as I graduated from college again to follow in my dad's footsteps. Um, and I started out in this industry about as bottom of the barrel as you can start out. I started out driving Pepsi trucks in a blue polyester Pepsi uniform with patches all over it. Um, and I spent my first nine, nine and a half years with Pepsi and worked my way up through a whole host of different selling and operational and marketing positions. Um, At the end of that nine, 10 year stretch, my father had begun his retirement process within Nabisco and he had hired a bunch of my college buddies uh, to go to work for Nabisco who were all still there. And they, for all intents and purposes said, Matty, you gotta come back home. Come to Nabisco, your dad's retiring, it's time. And I thought about it long and hard because I loved Pepsi. Uh, But the one thing Nabisco was really good at that Pepsi was a little behind was category management. And uh, they were widely regarded in the industry as the best of the best. Um, And I felt that was a missing piece uh, to my skill set. So I made the decision to go back home. Uh, I went to work for Nabisco um, and spent and immediately moved to San Antonio, Texas uh, to take on a market unit uh, for Nabisco. And I spent about five and a half years with the Nabisco company. And during that period of time, uh, I was in San Antonio, Texas, and then I was out in Pleasanton, California 
calling on Safeway stores. Um, a craft had purchased Nabisco kind of mm -hmm. during that, that stretch of time. And I'll be very honest, I did not love Kraft as much as I love Nabisco and PepsiCo. Very bureaucratic, very slow, very non-innovative. Um, so I was thinking about what do I want to do next? Here I am in California and loved calling on Safeway. And I got a phone call from Steve Bird, who was Safeway's CEO at the time. And Steve asked me to do uh, so Steve and I go to dinner and I have no idea what the heck he wants to talk about. Um, but he comes straight through the front door and says, Matt, we'd like you to consider becoming a retailer. Have you ever thought about it? And I, my first reaction was, no, my father would kill me <laughs> if I ever went to the other side of the table. Um, and he asked me to think about it, which I did. And ultimately through a whole host of these are the pros, these are the cons, uh, of, of making this change, I decided to go to work for Safeway and go to that other side of the desk. Um, I ran beverage, snacks, alcohol, and tobacco, um, a bunch of categories that I was pretty familiar with, given my PepsiCo and, and my Nabisco background. Um, and I became a merchant. And I did that uh, for about two and a half years. Uh, and then a gentleman who's been incredibly successful in this industry came uh, to Safeway, a gentleman by the name of Brian Cornell, uh, who happens to be the CEO of Target today. Um, Brian, and I, Brian and I both had PepsiCo backgrounds. We developed a relationship, um, and Brian plucked me out of merchandising and asked if I would go run this little thing that they had just bought out of bankruptcy called Safeway.com. Um, it was a very early stage pioneer in the e-commerce food delivery space. And it was in rough shape. And Brian said, you're not getting any new capital and um, you need to figure this out in six months because we're gonna shut it down if there's not a business there. So um, in December of 05, 2005, I became CEO of Safeway.com. <laughs> um, and had and I told Brian, I said, Brian, you're asking me to run a tech company I can barely use email. Um, I am not a tech guy. And he said, don't worry. He said, you'll figure it out. It's like running a DSD company. It's all good. Um, so I dropped into Safeway.com. Within two years, we had doubled the size of our, our revenue organically. Um, and we had become operating income profitable about a year ahead of our, our pro forma. So the Safeway organization was thrilled. Um, they bought out the other investors, which included Tesco, uh, a big retailer over in uh, over in Europe. And um, I led the company through that M and A. Um, at the end of that, uh, I'd been in California for eight years. My Safeway experience, I loved it. Um, you know, had the opportunity to go back into a merchandising role there. Um, but it was time for me to get a little closer to home. My parents were getting a little older. My children were getting a little older. And that's when I moved to Jacksonville for the first time, Sarah. And I, uh, I was the lead merchant for Winn-Dixie stores right after Winn-Dixie had come out of bankruptcy. Um, and there was a handful of us that were brought in to, to see if we could help turn Winn-Dixie around, um, which uh, I'm glad to say that we did. Um, when Dixie uh, in 2012 uh, was purchased by a private equity group, it was wonderful exit um, for our shareholders. And quite frankly, it allowed when Dixie to turn into Southeastern Grocers, uh, which is today part of the Aldi Corporation. So um, probably one of my most enjoyable um, pieces of my career, because when we inherited Winn-Dixie, there were 50,000 employees and it was a zero sum game. We were either going to succeed or those 50,000 employees were going to have to look for a new job. Um, when we merged uh, with Bilo to form Southeastern Grocers, we had over 65,000 employees. Um, so uh, we didn't uh, have to shut down a bunch of stores, which was 
absolutely phenomenal. Um, on upon that exit, um, I then went to the other side of food, which I knew nothing about, uh, but the food service side of food. And I went to work for Cisco, and I I ran a chunk of their corporate merchandising activity, um, and loved working for Cisco. Uh, was in Houston, Texas for a little over four years. And unfortunately, that's when um, we had a little bit of a family uh, tragedy that struck. Uh, I lost my dad, who I mentioned was my hero, rather suddenly. And my wife lost her dad um, rather suddenly uh, within about a 90-day stretch of time. Um, So it was a life event that made me rethink, you know, hey, I got to be closer to home. I got to get back to Florida. Um, but what do I what do I want to do? Um, and I had been uh, collecting board seats, um, you know, kind of earlier in my Winn Dixie and my Cisco days. And that's when I pivoted and said, "How can I take all of this experience and really help?" these innovative companies in the food and beverage place, uh, in the food food and beverage space succeed. Um, so I took a leap of faith. I went out on my own um, and I got, uh, I got in more actively involved um, with these small emerging innovative companies in the food and beverage space. Um, and over time, um, I got involved with more and more companies Uh, That enabled me to get involved with capital companies. One in particular, um, I'm sure you've heard of, is Goldman Sachs. Um, And because of the success that these handful of companies have been able to uh, deliver, um, I am now um, a Goldman Sachs turnaround CEO. Um, So I... I engage with various Goldman Sachs companies, either as an independent director or sometimes uh, as a CEO, um, and I help get their portfolio of companies um, kind of on the right track again. And uh, I've also got relationships with a handful of other uh, capital partners now, Um, but I would say the second half of my career has been all about helping really smart, emerging, innovative companies figure out how to ha- how to succeed in this crazy industry of food and beth. It's really great. So that's a long story, but it's because mm. I'm old. I mean, I know Laura is probably chomping at the bit because the amount of overlap with all three of our careers is just so fun and exciting. So Laura... I'm so sure. that you've come a long way from blue polyester. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes, right? I, I think I still have one of them in my closet just for, <laughs> for old time's sake. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, one question that I have, or just kind of shed some light on it. As you look to, you know, going from big corporate down to, hey, I'm a, a one person show to now it seems like you're kind of going back. How have you... Um, mentally really prepared for that because I think yeah. sometimes we see in our business that can be a challenge one way or the other. So I just would love to hear from you kind of, um, I don't think we've got it mastered either. So any tips and tricks, uh, welcome that. I tell you, Laura, that is, that is a phenomenal question because I don't, uh, I don't know that there's an easy answer to it because you're absolutely right. I was used to being in this corporate bubble, you know, everything from the check showed up every other week and you just picked your benefits package once a year and you take so many things for granted when you're in this corporate world that all of a sudden are gone um, when you pivot out onto your own. Your, your, your own. And obviously there were were some things I knew going in, um, but quite frankly, there was a whole bunch that I didn't. And I think at the end of the day, what helped me um, was just the self-belief and the courage to jump in, not even knowing how deep the pool is, but having faith in my 
experiential background in corporate America that I was just going to figure it out. And trust me, there were days where I questioned myself, you know, what have you done, especially at that stage in my life where I was a little longer um, in my career. Um, But as I sit back and look back today, uh, about four and a half years post making this pivot, um, I am so very glad that I did. Um, My career today, what I do today is very different, um, but it is so incredibly rewarding. Mm -hmm. And I would just, if I could give anybody one or two pieces of advice that are thinking about doing it is one, believe in yourself. You are a heck of a lot smarter and you're a heck of a lot better than you give yourself credit for. I think we're all our biggest self-critics. And two, just go into it with a spirit of learning. Um, It is a great time Uh, And I'm a big believer that you should never, ever, ever start learning. Um, You know, the old saying of when you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Um, I am a huge believer in that. Um, And I think if you go into it with that attitude to where you're going to be open, you're going to be willing to put yourself out there and network and listen and meet people that you might have otherwise not met. Um, it is unbelievable how much your community will give back to you if you invest a little bit in it. That's great. I mean, Matt, I, you know, I think there's something to be said too for your willingness to kind of take that leap to have the humility. I mean, you just are one of the most, you know, loving, compassionate humble people that I've ever met. I mean, your, your background is so amazing yet, you know, I just feel like you have this internal, like, what the heck I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and try stuff. And just, I mean, so I do feel like there's this beauty in your character that allows you to step in and say like, well, I mean, why not? Let's give it a shot. And, uh, I think that's why you've been so successful, you know, in my um, honest impression of what I think you've done. Well, I'm, I'm humbled by you saying that. Thank you. Um, and that is directly attributable, um, to my parents. Um, thankfully my mom's still alive. In fact, I'm headed down to go see her here later this afternoon. Um, but I'll, I, I will always remember a car ride with my dad. Um, And I'll remember it like it was yesterday because it was one of those seminal moments in somebody's life. And I was a young kid. I don't know how young I was, but, you know, I was old enough to remember it, but I was young enough to, you know, not really understand what my dad did. And my dad had just um, taken on uh, the role of head of sales for Nabisco. And it was back in the Barbarians at the Gate days when Mm -hmm. KKR had come in. Ross Johnson, who my dad now worked for. And so it was pretty crazy. And I was in that car with my dad and I said, dad, I said, I don't understand how you do a job that's this big. You have all these customers and all these products and you have, you know, thousands of people that you have to to motivate and you have shareholders and now you have KKR and like how do you manage all of this and he kind of smiled and he just looked at me and he's and he said he said Matt he said I actually have the easiest job in the company and I was like no I, what are you talking about and I said he said yeah he said all I have to do is take care of and inspire and bring in the right character people to our organization. And if I do that one simple thing, they all take care of my customers who remain incredibly happy. And when happy customers, when when customers are happy, they buy more. And when they buy more, um, guess what? All of those other people, the shareholders and KKR and everybody else, they're happy. 
Um, so I just never lose sight of what is the single most important thing that I do. And that is I put people first. And as long as that foundation is strong, everything else takes care of itself. And I will never forget that conversation um, because, you know, you go to business school or you go to college and everybody wants to tell you how hard business is. And you got to know the numbers and the finance and the structures and the marketplace. And there's a thousand things they tell you, you know, you need to be really good at. You need to be expertise at. And my dad just broke it down to where it's. No, what you need to be really expertise at is people. And if you can do that exceptionally well, everything else takes care of itself. And I've tried to live by that conversation in my career. I haven't always succeeded, but I've tried. Um, and, you know, having that belief that if you can get the people right, um, structure drives behavior, behavior drives results. Um, then your business, whatever business it is, uh, is going to be incredibly successful. It's great. I mean, I was just thinking about how you greeted me with, you know, your comment about the restaurant and Zach's the best. Like, it doesn't matter what type of a business you have. If people oh. have the care, have the compassion, they have the willingness to um, come in an authentic manner and. I mean, again, I said it earlier, roll up their sleeves. Like there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And if people just lean in, we can do a lot of fun things. So, And Matt, what I took away too is like, be human with people. Like, you know, we spend so much of our time at work and it's okay to love your work family too. I mean, you know, sometimes you don't always like them, but you love them, you know? Um, But I think that's, that's an important message that sometimes, sometimes in the world of technology and not seeing people and all that, it kind of gets a little hard to, to kind of have that connection. Mm-hmm. You have to be authentic. And this is where I see a lot of leaders and a lot of companies, they get lost, right? You know, with all due respect to my HR professional friends out there. Um, HR can be a little bit cold, you know, um, it can be a little bit about rules and regulations and compliance and governance. And I'm not saying, you know, that that is that, you know, that that is bad. It's just how you come across with doing all of the right things in a more authentic human way is really at the end of the day what it's all about. HR can be really, really simple if just every single day you're guided by just do the right thing. And we were faced uh, early on um, when I was CEO of iControl, we were faced with a serious conundrum where um, we had uh, a team of individuals that was working for a third party that we had a long relationship with, and they were over in Ukraine. Um, And there was a handful of individuals in Ukraine um, working for us through a third party when the Ukraine-Russian conflict broke out. Mm -hmm. And at the time, iControl wasn't in the best of shape. Um, And we were still burning cash, we weren't profitable, We were a long way away from being, quote unquote, turned around. And we had to make a decision uh, because these folks were fleeing with their families for their lives. And they weren't going to, you know, Internet was down. They were going to be offline for an unknown period of time. And given that they went through a third party, the business manual would have told you it's really simple. Just go find another third party. Um, you know, so that you can continue to get the work done that these people were doing for you. Um, We threw the business manual out because what we did is we continued to pay those people their full salary um, and basically said, when you and your families are safe and you're ready to distract yourself with a little work, let us know. 
And we went to that third party and we said, look, we're making this commitment to your folks. Our expectation now of you is that you take some of the fees that we pay you and you send them to these people that are working for us, which they actually did. Um, Mm -hmm. So, and guess what? That resonated with the entire company, not just the Ukrainian people, um, but it re- it resonated with everybody in our organization that, you know, wow, that is a pretty cool stance that our company decided to make. And at the end of the day, in terms of dollars and cents, it, it cost us very, very little to do the right thing. Um, but sometimes at the end of the day, the way you, if you will, create a culture of authenticity is to throw the HR manual out, to throw the business manual out, and to just in your gut, in your soul, just go do the right thing. And it'll pay itself back in spades. That's what I've found over the course of my career. Matt, that was going to be my, sorry, sir. No, I was just going to say that's such an amazing story. My question was going to be, so fast forward, and unfortunately they're still in the conflict, you know, are those individuals settled? Are they back working on your business? Because I bet they're working twice as hard for you now. Thankfully, um, every single one of them survived. Mm -hmm. Um, And as far as we know, their families um, survived, their direct families Um, And the answer is yes, we still work with that third party and we still work um, with uh, with most, if not all of those those individuals. And Mm -hmm. you betcha. I mean, these folks, you know, um, I I heard stories of if these folks would literally be in shelters um, and they'd be working, you know, in in the middle of the night. Um, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to help us out and to do what they did for us. So, um, yeah, I mean, no business manual, no business school would, would necessarily teach, Hey, that's the, that's the right thing to do from a business standpoint. But, you know, sometimes you come to those crossroads and you just have to do the right thing. You know, it's interesting. You bring up that story. I haven't thought about this in a long time. But a similar situation happened to me when I was at General Mills and I was working, um, you know, for for a certain um, manager who recognized, I mean, I was in crisis. My mom had been diagnosed with brain cancer and my dad and I were her main, um, I would say, nurses or care providers. I mean, we were taking her down to the Mayo Clinic in in, uh, Rochester from like the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Anyway, my point is, this was before remote-based work, and they allowed me to take her to her, um, you know, chemo and radiation, and work from down in Rochester and things like that. And you know, again, I mean, I'm sure General Mills corporate probably would have said, "Well, we got to have you know good productivity." But I mean, I came back with this kind of uh, loyalty and feeling of you supported me when I needed the most. And yeah. now I will give my whole heart times three, right? And and so I do think that there are some really amazing ways of supporting people that may not get, they might not make the paper, but you know, it's mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's the right thing to do um, for the humans that are on your team. Or yeah, yeah. that's really a neat story. Oh, I, mean, I have goosebumps yeah. head to toe. And so. if you do it with authenticity, it's like it shouldn't make the paper. Right. Totally. Yeah. It, 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 it should. Unfortunately, most of the bad stuff is the only stuff that ever makes the paper. Yeah. But, right. So, no, no, Sarah, you're, you're absolutely right. If, if you can come across, you know, uh, employee engagement is a huge topic, right? And there's all sorts of statistics out there that, you know, upwards of over 50% of the workforce mm-hmm. is completely disengaged. Mm -hmm. from the work that they do. Right. And my goodness, if you can find a way um, to cut that in half and imagine the amount of productivity, if you can cut that in half and here's the deal. And what I've found 
is it's never the big things. You know, it's never throwing more money at people or, you know, those sort of things or the, you know, the forced fun that some companies <laughs> try to do, right? It's always real awkward. And it's awkward because it's not authentic. Um, right. Is if you can just create human connections, authentic human connections, um, you know, with the folks on your team, um, then they're going to run through a wall for you. And um, in, in my view, the role of the CEO um, is not to be the smartest person in finance and the smartest person in sales and the smartest person in operations, because I'm far from all that. Um, but the CEO's role at the end of the day is to keep the company energized about the strategic path, the journey that we're on. And to encourage them along the way and to make sure that the individuals across the company are all collaborating and they're positive and they understand what the expectations are and they're energized to deliver those expectations. At the end of the day, that's the heart and soul of the role of the CEO. I'll be the first to admit um, you know, I was by far not the smartest guy in the room in any of my functions, but I had really, really good people um, in all of those functions that were the smartest people in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all I needed to do again, going back to that car ride, is I just needed to inspire and empower them and let them go do what they're brilliant at doing. And everything else was going to take care of itself. That's awesome. I was with a client yesterday that ironically is the CEO of his, um, I would say, medium to larger sized law firm. And he's the CEO, but he says that it stands for chief encouragement officer. Yes. And yes. I, I really I thought that was cute. You, you know, you could use excitement or whatever, but it's that empowerment. It's that, you know, getting people fired up towards the cause telling them they're doing a great job, you know, yeah. and so I love that. So speaking of, you know, Laura is one of my favorite bosses that I've ever had at General Mills. And so I sort of, you know, I, I think everything you said, you know, in terms of um, getting a team rallied, um, the people that worked for, for Laura at General Mills would run through a brick wall for her then, yeah. and they would today. And today. So, yeah, totally. I mean, there's people around the country and hopefully they're listening and they can chime in with their comments because okay. she deserves a lot of love. But I mean, she did that through authenticity and, you know, and um, also the customers, I think, kind of knew too, Laura, to be fair. I think, you know, calling on all these customers from Walmart to H-E-B to everybody in between. And um, it was really fun. But I think they all knew Laura meant business, but she sure had your back. Absolutely. Nice. <laughs> I had a, but Matt, like you said, I had a great team. I had the, the luxury of we weren't always seen to be the smartest, <laughs> but we all were able to work together and we were by far the smartest. So the power, you know, the exponential power that we all had. So oh. it, was, it was a great time. It was a magic, you know, they say in your career, magical times. It's kind of, it was a magic Absolutely. time. Yeah. Um, so there are there are um, many engagements that I've done uh, seven turnarounds or accelerations um, in my career. And knock on wood, um, I'm seven for seven. So knock on wood. Um, nice. But one of the things that I do notice often when I when I drop into certain situations is. Is the CEO an hourglass leader or a top hat leader? And uh, what I mean by that is we've all seen an hourglass and there's a bunch of sand on the top and it has to flow through this really tight opening and then eventually it gets to the bottom. Um, is the CEO that tight spot in the middle? Um, does everything have to run through that CEO? Does every decision have to run through that CEO or does the CEO create a culture where everybody is disempowered and thinks it all has to run 
through that CEO. Um, in many cases, um, that is kind of the situation that I, I drop mm-hmm. into. And especially in uh, founder-led organizations, sure. founders are really, really great at starting something. Um, and then there comes a point in time in their journey where they have to stop acting like a founder and start acting like a leader. And there's a massive difference. And I've seen so many instances where the founder, not intentionally, not maliciously, um, but they become that, you know, the middle of the hourglass And what that does ultimately at the end of the day is it stops innovation. It stifles growth. And they, their company that, you know, may have been on a rocket ship um, not so very long ago, all of a sudden begins to stall. Um, And it's very difficult um, in many cases for founders to find their way out of, of that conundrum. And um, a big part of what I hope to accomplish in my second half career is to help CEOs who are in that stuck, in that I'm in the middle of the hourglass. I just joined uh, a healthcare board out of Denver, Colorado, uh, was so incredibly impressed with this CEO and founder because he knew he was stuck and he didn't know how to get out. Um, so we got connected and I'm now part, um, of his organization that is actively helping him get unstuck. Uh, and this company I think is going to be a rocket ship. Um, and, uh, I, I just, I love working with CEOs, um, and founders who have that self-awareness to know when to go ask for help. I've just seen too many that kind of hang on to that belief that they're the smartest person in the room. I started this. This is my baby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's going to live and die with me. And unfortunately, all too often, that attitude leads to it's more likely going to die with you um, than live with you. Um, So um, anyhow. How much of that, because we see that all the time with our clients. I mean, I would say... We primarily work with founders or, you know, owners that maybe took over shortly after the founder, but um, that are acting as those hourglass kind of leaders. And so how much of it do you find is actually, and I, and I, it's the psychological component, they have trust issues or they have fear that's stifling them. I mean, this seems like you're coming in as a counselor in a lot of senses to the CEO and saying like, it's okay. I'm going to strap your hands down. You're yeah. not going to do anything. You're, you're along for the ride. You brought the right people. Let them go. Yeah. Let them go. Yeah. I honestly think that certainly there are instances, you know, where their own self doubt, um, you know, or being, you know, fearful of letting go. Hey, I've got in many cases, man, this is my entire life, right? I've got my entire livelihood in this thing. I can't entrust it to somebody else. Um, But uh, I also see a lot of, they just don't know what to do. The beauty of our experiences kind of coming up through corporate America is guess what? We were taught how to lead. Uh, in very specific and incremental ways. We were taught what it's like, you know, to have teams and to have to be accountable to a number and to have to care Mm -hmm. for people. In many cases, these founders did not have that same experience. They weren't taught that. And now all of a sudden they're thrown in you know, let's say they catch a tiger by the tail and their business all of a sudden hockey sticks, you know, literally in some cases overnight, they could now have this hundred plus person company with $10 million of revenue. And they've got uh, outside capital that they have to take care of. I mean, these types of things can spin up and happen really, really fast. 
Um, and in in many cases, they just don't have the inherent skill sets um, because they've never been taught how to actually be a leader in that type of situation. Yeah, that's a good point, because what you made me think of is, you know, back to corporate America days that, you know, we all three have been a part of. If there's a question and it's like, gosh, I have no idea. I'm going to go ask the HR person or the finance person. Or the, so you get this kind of training of like, I don't have to know everything because there's a department for that. And I'm going to go right. talk to the expert. And so when you have a founder and they have built it from the ground up, they may have been enough at the point in time when they started, the business has scaled. They now need an expert to come in. And yeah, I think that's a really interesting um, kind of moment of reflection for me on just, you know, we we learned to ask for help because we were never expected exactly. to know everything. Exactly. Like yeah. Sarah, I remember the story uh, you told me about a, a law firm that you were working with and, you know, one of the partners, like a phenomenal lawyer, like unbelievable lawyer, um, you know, was now trying to venture into some of the administrative functions of their law firm because mm -hmm. they had gotten to the size where they needed to do that. And this individual was struggling mightily. Um, because, you know, didn't necessarily know how to go build out these other administrative yeah. functions. And I think this individual was another one of those unique individuals that recognized this early yeah. enough on that they were able to ask for help. Um, and his firm benefited greatly from him asking for help. Yeah. Well, and I think what kind of comes into play, too, that we see is, again, if you're a founder, you've clearly been somewhat successful. You still have a business of course. and you've kind of, you know, you've been able to fake it maybe a little bit on the HR and a few other areas and heaven forbid you say you don't know what you're doing and you ask for help. And like, how could I possibly bring typically someone in maybe that might be younger that might have the expertise in the area. So we kind of end up coaching people on like, it's okay that you don't know everything. No, you know, we're all human. We can't possibly know everything. And nor are you good at everything. I mean, frankly, right? I'm not a good doctor. No. <laughs> yeah. It's not what I'm trained to do. So I think um, it's all good insight from the standpoint of, you know, this growth, what it, what it means to grow your business and the role that you play as a CEO. And I think you're, you know, I love the founder versus leader. I might a, thief. And, I might thief and doctor that. That's okay. Big difference. Yeah. So, what types of businesses are you working with right now, Matt? I mean, what if if someone's listening and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I could really use a turnover expert." Mm -hmm. What kinds of businesses? Not turnover. Turn around. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I said the wrong word. Definitely words. don't want it to turn over. Without, or, right? or I was thinking maybe we could talk about like pop tart turnovers. You know, like it's like a an actual bakery turnover. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> apologies. I meant turnaround. And what types of businesses? Here is um, what I've learned over the years. Is I uh, I grew up as I mentioned in food and beverage, and I certainly know enough to be dangerous in in that vertical. Mm -hmm. But what I've also learned, having done um, a number of turnarounds and accelerations, all different shapes and sizes, all different um, types of turnarounds and accelerations, supplier, technology, distribution, um, you know, retail. Um, what I've found is that the fundamentals there's eight areas, generally speaking, um, that our, are not operating optimally, that is creating the business to, to sputter. Um, and uh, those eight areas, when I get involved with the business, that is where I start to poke around. Mm -hmm. um, because generally speaking, you can find the problem um, in those eight areas. As a matter of fact, I would almost guarantee it um, that somewhere 
in those eight buckets, you're missing something. And uh, so therefore, Sarah, to get to the answer to your question, um, I'm with uh, today, um, I'm engaged with a supply chain freight company that ships products all over the globe. Uh, I mentioned I recently joined a healthcare company. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in SaaS um, technology. Um, I've been in the payment space. Um, I am uh, currently engaged with a, uh, a, a branded company that's launching a new brand. Um, I'm involved with Sarah, you and I've talked a lot about Tended Bar, yes. um, which is um, uh, a disruptor in the arena and hotel um, space. And uh, so at the end of the day, um, given my experience and my, if you will, platform, mm -hmm. I'm almost more energized to go jump into something that I know very little about um, and apply, you know, kind of my playbook of these eight things. Um, and I can guarantee you um, that the marketplace may be different. The vernacular may be a little different. The widget may be different, but the fundamentals of those eight things are going to be exactly the same. Hmm. So I'm involved I have gone way outside my comfort zone I love uh, it. and gotten mm -hmm. outside of, of food and beverage. So in short order, I am not afraid to step in um, to almost anything. The eight. Love it. That's the title of your book. <laughs> Actually, you know what? It's funny you mentioned that because one of these days I'm going to get around to writing one. You should. Um, the title of my book is It's All About the Athletes. Oh. It's all about the athletes. Okay. Um, and then we'll go into the eight things that, you know, all invariably um, you have to have the right people to go pull yes. off and execute. But um, it's all about the athletes. What was your position in baseball? I was a pitcher. Okay. I kind uh -oh. of thought that might be the case. Laura's husband was also a pitcher. There you go. Uh, Laura, we love pitchers. Yes. My son is a pitcher as well, or was a pitcher. There, but lefty there or righty. You know, in, in the world of baseball, um, the, the pitcher kind of is a very unique position, right? Because they're the only ones on the team who have a win-loss record. Yep. Right? Everybody else on the team is kind of – strapped with the win-loss record of the team. Yeah. But a pitcher has their own win-loss record. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be a pitcher, you have to have thick skin because, you know, front and center is going to be, you know, your win-loss record and how that, you know, positively or negatively impacts the team. Wow. Um, you're in the middle of the field and you're elevated. So... Um, All eyes. You've yeah, all eyes are on the pitcher. Hmm. Um, so again, if you're going to be a pitcher, you have to be okay with the good and the bad that comes with being in the middle of the field and being elevated on a pedestal because it ain't always pretty. I've given up more than my fair share of home runs in my life, and that's a miserable feeling when you're standing there alone, um, watching the guy who just <laughs> took you yard run around the bases. And the third thing is everything begins with you. Nothing happens. Nobody moves until you move. Um, so, you know, kind of those unique characteristics of being a pitcher, um, you know, are, are quite frankly, I've found, you know, wonderful life lessons that you can take to being a leader. Um you got to be okay. The scorecard is the scorecard. The scorecard mm -hmm. never lies. Hmm. You win or you lose. It doesn't matter if you felt you threw a good game. The umpire was a little off. What a, your guys didn't score enough <laughs> runs. Doesn't matter. The scorecard is the or the scoreboard is the scoreboard. You either hmm. win or lose, and you have to have the mindset to where you're okay with both of those. 
Um, and to just keep working, to just keep grinding, to just keep learning, um, you know, to try to get a little bit better every day. And so um, it's interesting, Laura, that you're married to a pitcher, but it's uh, <laughs> I'd be curious, you know, if, if that kind of describes his mindset a little bit, because it certainly um, was something that I was taught playing that position. Well, first of all, I would say, are you a lefty or a righty? I'm a righty. Right. Okay. Yep. I'm right. Too. Which is our why I'm book. talking to you today. If I was our left, son, our yeah, yeah, it's opening day, right? Opening day, yeah. right? Uh, opening day today. The only thing I would add about you pitchers is you spend a lot of time in your head, and so sometimes, <laughs> as you're leading, you sometimes have to say, "Hey, wait, I'm the extrovert first baseman. You kind of got to tell me a couple things." So. One thousand percent. That's 1, good. Thousand percent. I am incredibly superstitious. Um, I wore a t-shirt um, uh, every time I pitched. It was the same t-shirt in high school and all through college. By the time I was a senior in college, it had been washed so much you could see through it, um, and it was an all-county basketball camp oh, gray t-shirt um, <laughs> that I Love got it. when I was in high school. And I think I just thrown it on one day and it was a day where I, I threw a no hitter or perfect game or something in high school. And from that day forward, uh, that t-shirt was underneath my uniform, no matter what. Wow. So, where did you, where'd you pitch, Matt? I, uh, I went to the university of Richmond in Virginia. Oh, spider. Uh, so I'm a mighty spider. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Our, yep. Our son looked at that. So great. Okay, tool. so I have Pepsi polyester, I have an hourglass, and I have a gray t-shirt. That's right. These are some good visuals. Good, good visuals. And I do have an hourglass in my my home. Huh? That's a good reminder. I might yeah. be buying a couple hourglasses to remind a couple of our client founders to <laughs> stop yep. being the pinch Maybe. point. Maybe we can invent one. It's an hourglass, and then it's kind of like the Rubik's Cube, and then it becomes a top hat. Nice. Absolutely. Like you think about it, right? You put, you put sand in an hourglass and sand in a bucket. You turn them both over at the same time. You know, which moves faster? Right. I love that. Love okay. it. Okay. Well, how will people get in touch with you if they are interested in? either a pastry turnover, no, just kidding, or <laughs> turnaround, or just picking your brain. How, how should they reach out if they need you? Personal email is fantastic. All right. Um, All right. And there it is. There it is. Thank you, Matt. Allison. <laughs> um, Matt, truly, thank you for allowing us to chat with you about your journey. I mean, you've done so many incredible things in your life. And thanks for just being a really good human. Well, thank you both um, for having me, Laura. It was a pleasure yeah. uh, to to meet you. Hopefully, one of these days we can do it over a panino <laughs> at Trasca. For sure, uh, with, with a beer. Uh, yes, yes, with a beer. Yes. <laughs> now that there's the, you know, the 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 little tap room right next to it. Yeah. So, um, anyhow, you all you have see? a wonderful Easter. Did you see yes. Trevor Lawrence came by this week? I saw the picture on your social. Yep. Yeah. Came That's right over to that tap room and had, I think he had a panino too. So that's awesome. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you both. Have a Thank wonderful you, man. Happy day. Easter too. Y'all have a wonderful Easter. Have okay. a great Thanks. weekend. Bye, you guys. Thank you again. You bet. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Level Up Your Business with me, Sarah Frasca. If you have a problem in your business that's keeping you up at night, please join us in a future episode so we can help get you unstuck. Just click in the link in the show notes and send us a message. Please remember, stay innovative, friends.